Hi, this is Justin Aquilanti, ESA Sales Director, here today with Mike Baker, Global Director of Battery Energy Storage, Frank Jacob, Technology Manager, Energy Storage, and Tyler Johnston, Global Head of Strategic Partnerships, Distributed Energy for Black & Veatch. Gentlemen, welcome. Mike, the demand for battery energy storage solutions continues to increase, and with that comes new challenges, innovations, and use cases. Can you talk to us about some of the recent trends that Black & Veatch is seeing in the industry? Thank you, Justin. Um, it's been an exciting year in battery energy storage with the, the exponential growth continuing even despite the pandemic. Um, this year, we've seen considerable increases in the number of projects that were DC coupled, taking advantages of efficiencies um, with the uh, loss of the inverter clipping with DC coupling. Um, to dovetail right along with that, the big increase in the hybrid uh, projects, a uh, tremendous increase of battery energy storage associated with solar, uh, new solar fields going up, and also uh, increasing percentages of wind projects that are also incorporating battery energy storage. The, uh, the most exciting of the new trends is the question what, what comes after four hours of storage? What does long duration storage look like 2022 and beyond? Frank, Mike mentioned long duration storage as a current trend. Can you talk to us about why long duration storage will be so important as variable renewable energy production increases? Very important, um, Justin. Long duration storage is this year's new thing in energy storage. Last year it was hydrogen and hydrogen's becoming as big as ever. But long duration storage, uh, the technologies are not all that ready for commercialization in prime time. So there's a lot of development to be had for storage durations of, of more than four hours, which you could get out of a cell-based uh, battery design like we do with lithium ion today. And, and it's always remarkable to me that uh, 100 years ago, we built long duration storage, pumped hydroelectric, and we typically have eight or 12 hours worth of storage. And, and their use case was designed for that length. It was to load level coal and nuclear plants over the course of a day and let them run at efficient levels so that we could save that energy in the night and push it out during the day and then um, go on day after day. But um, with the increase in variable renewable generation, which is now on top of the variable loads that we've always had, there's a lot more dynamics on the grid, a lot more need for uh, flexible resources and uh, saving as much renewable energy as when it can be generated to be used later on when it's going to be needed. And so durations of more than noon to the evening, but from today to tomorrow, uh, we had a client recently who had us um, designed for 2025 long duration storage that uh, would be 48 hours in duration and they aspire to 168 hours and there are developers uh, throughout the country throughout the world that are seeking solutions to those problems so variable renewables when variable loads creates more complexity on the grid and storage is is one of a few solutions that could be used to keep the grid balanced stable, reliable, resilient. Mike, safety will always be a primary focus when developing and implementing battery technologies. What is Black & Veatch's experience and approach to the safety of their battery solutions? Oh, that's a great question, Justin. At Black & Veatch, safety is one of our core values. And with battery energy storage, it's been a focus since day one of the development of this business line. Um, we have professionals within Black & Beach that sit on the NFPA 855 Code Committee. Um, we take all of their recommendations and even some of their advanced work, and we apply it into our design, safety by design. Um, deflagration studies and focuses on fire suppression, explosion prevention have led the, uh, the development, the new development in battery energy storage this year. Um, energy management system, the controls logic, unracking, offending batteries, um, mo maintenance and monitoring, monitoring of the daily operation, operational characteristics of the batteries um, is very important, as is the proper design of the battery enclosure 
Um, as, I, as I said earlier, um, the uh, deflagration studies, understanding the blast radiuses and the safe working distances and adjusting your plant layout to accommodate these um, has been a real focus in the design progression and development within Black and Veatch um, this year. Thank you. Tyler, what trends are you seeing develop related to BESS behind the meter and what role will distributed energy resources play in addressing the uncertainty caused by the intermittency of renewables and the increasing frequency of severe weather events? Thanks, Justin. That's a that's a long question. So let me break that up into a couple of parts. You know, to talk about trends behind the meter, I want to start just by talking about battery trends in general. So Bloomberg New Energy Finance released an uh, article a couple of weeks ago that said that energy storage is poised to steal $277 billion from the power markets over the next, uh, until 2050, 2020 to 2050. And their premise is that as the cost of lithium ion storage drops you know, up to 68% over that time, the uh, batteries become cheaper than transmission and distribution new build assets, which ultimately drives a trend that's really good for batteries. Um, over the course of the last, uh, the last quarter of 2020, um, from Q3 to Q4, battery energy storage installations actually rose 182%. So that shows a lot of growth in batteries in general, but about 80% of that was front of the meter. And battery energy storage behind the meter actually uh, declined over that same amount of time. So we're actually seeing the trends right now in real time declining over the last year. And we believe that's mainly because of the demand for front of the meter storage. Most of the projects we're looking at at Black and Beach are in the front of the meter and that's where the OEMs are focused with supply. Um, and then obviously the pandemic has also caused a hesitancy for commercial and industrial clients to spend their own CapEx, which has probably you know, dialed back projects a little bit. And then the regulatory environment, which I think is actually really positive for behind the meter storage and I'll, I'll talk about in a second, is ultimately inhibited some of the growth in that area and we're seeing changes on the horizon that can that, that bode well for that part of the industry. So on the regulatory side, we'll kind of start at the federal level and there's some emerging federal regulations right now that are really interesting for behind the meter storage. The first and probably kind of buzzword around this industry is FERC 2222, which is making it easier for distributed energy resources to play in wholesale capacity and ancillary markets where they exist around the country. There's also intense lobbying going on right now in Congress for uh, the ITC to apply to standalone storage systems. It currently does not and, um, and, and has to be coupled with solar. So that would obviously drive increases there. And then President Biden's recent announcement about our executive order about electrifying the federal fleet will also drive a need for energy storage as there's an increasing demand for clean energy or clean electrons going into these vehicles. Um, and then I'll kind of talk about the trends as we see them in the regional level across the US because there's some that are emerging and that will tie to the last part of the question here. So um, in California, just, just a couple months back at the end of 2020, PG&E began lobbying to the state to increase distributed energy resources on their grid as a, as a reaction to the uh, weather events that happened back in September around, around the, uh, the blackouts that happened there. And a, a good amount of that was behind the meter. So you know, we're seeing trends. California has always been a leader in storage, solidifying a lot of the solar there, but we're seeing increasing trends there as well. Um, and then other, other markets that we're active in in the US are the Northeast, both New York ISO and Massachusetts, where the SMART program in Massachusetts and adjustments to the software in New York ISO have started to incentivize batteries and allow them to participate in both retail and wholesale markets. And then I'll kind of close and wrap up the last part of the question with Texas, which is where I live. I'm based in Houston and, and got to live through the, the challenges we had in ERCOT back in February. And traditionally in ERCOT, uh, since deregulation occurred, transmission and distribution utilities have not been permitted to own batteries or distributed energy resources. And generators refer to these as generation, while the transmission and distribution utilities refer to them as tools, like a transformer or other pieces of equipment that they have uh, to, to engage when, when crisis hits. So there is uh, Texas state legislature is currently debating this out now on changing that definition to allow transmission and distributed uh, distribution utilities 
to be able to own these battery energy storage systems and have that that capacity to pull that lever. And I think all that ties into kind of the last part of the question you asked around what does this mean for the increasing occurrence of these weather related events that require quick response at the community level. And if you think about the entire power grid in ERCOT or in Cal ISO as you know, centralized assets and infrastructure that are hard to respond and hard to winterize, distributed energy resources, whether it's solar or batteries or gensets, actually bode really well to hardening key parts of the grid where it's needed and being able to activate these when, when time calls on them. So overall, we're very long on battery energy storage behind the meter and we're able to leverage a lot of the experience that we've developed on the front of the meter in order to deliver for our clients in these areas. Frank, building on the discussion of climate change challenges, we've seen recently with extreme weather events in Texas and California, there have been some debate over whether renewable sources contributed to the challenges or if they actually help in situations like these. Could you weigh in on that? Oh, yes, uh, Justin. Texas. Te Texas was the perfect storm of weather, preparedness, policy implementations, and generation equipments uh, of all types, uh, renewable and conventional, which are designed for the common extreme, not the extreme extreme. You know, the ASHRAE 97 and a half percent design day is good for an average design. It's no, not good for an extreme design. And with the greater amount of extremes that we're seeing every week and every month across the country, a new approach to our grid system is, is needed to build resiliency back in, in, in the face of weather. So uh, renewables, renewables represent about a quarter of the energy generated in Texas. Renewables are the lowest cost form of new generation. So that's why they're there. That's why we're putting it out there. It's the lowest cost new energy generation for our clients. Uh, on the other hand, it's only 25%. There's 75% of equipment that uh, froze up, the cooling towers froze up and other elements happened. So um, if, I, if I had to really say something, I'd start arm wrestling you. Um, half the problem is policy and procedures and the way the ERCOT grid is set up. The other half of the problem was the equipment and the way it turned out behaving with extreme cold weather that lasted for not hours, not a day or two, but uh, a week or more. And uh, that was the root cause, balancing policy and operation against equipment. And if renewables is just a quarter of half, then it's down around 10%. Uh, it would have been great if um, w the sun had kept shining and the wind had kept blowing, but um, th there was a contributing factor there, but it's not the whole problem. It's a very complicated problem. We've got to unwind here very quickly. Gentlemen, great insights today. We heard a lot about Black & Veatch being a full service provider, front of the meter and behind the meter execution experience. And lastly, Black & Veatch's expertise in what is happening now leading to also them knowing and advising their clients what is coming down the road in the future and helping with the planning process. Really enjoyed having this conversation with you today. Look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you, Thanks, Justin. A pleasure. Very much. Thank you, Justin, and everybody else, be safe. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate it.